Thank you, Leona. Hey, welcome to church. This is your church. I just filled in the code on the back of the seat. First time visitor. And um, so I, I texted that through and uh, I'm sure I'll be getting lots of church spam email now. That's fine. It's what we do, right? We just send spam email to people as churches. But it's great to be part of this congregation and uh, heard lots about you and it's been great the last, well, really the last eight months, if you like. It's been a long time. I've been meeting with with Dave Shepherd and Ben Nowak as part of the steering group um, uh, with Steve Polglaze from our church for eight months, uh, kind of really intensely just seeking God, planning, praying. And, and a couple of months ago, we uh, launched six or seven teams, discernment teams to kind of uh, do some work on how to bring our two churches together. We had a go a few years ago, apparently, and didn't quite work out. That's okay. God's the God of second chances and uh, new beginnings. So we, we've been working on that. And in the, in the next week or two, we're going to kind of give out to our congregations, Mount Barker and here, Allgate, uh, a, a significant and serious proposal to come together and to uh, continue God's work as, uh, as one church, one Baptist church in the Adelaide Hills. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, I came over with Amanda, my dear wife here, uh, late, well, started actually today, one year ago, I was inducted at Mount Barker Baptist. So it's kind of my one year anniversary of being in the hills as a pastor. Um, but we came over, well, sure, you're very kind. We came over last year and uh, moved over in July. We, we were kind of skirting um, lockdowns and border closures. We were, we were like those lepers from Victoria who were carrying COVID, infecting everyone. We were locked down for 2020. Uh, we've been through a terrible time. It's been a difficult season in our lives. You know, going back, Amanda's parents in 2019 both died. We hit COVID lockdowns in Victoria 2020. There was a traumatic, just dark time in that state. Uh, and then moving over, relocating was a big thing. But God, God brought us here. And uh, I grew up in Adelaide, uh, grew up down Glenelg, Seacliff, Brighton, um, was kind of a bit of a surfer guy. Um, I couldn't surf, but I just made out I was a surfer um, because that was the cool thing to do back then. And loved Adelaide, moved out, became a Christian uh, here in about uh, 1991, so a while back and moved over to Sydney and then met Amanda. We moved to Melbourne, been there for 29 years. Good to be back. Um, I, I want to just say a quick word of thanks um, to Dave Shepherd, who I know is not here today, but uh, I've really loved getting to know Dave over, these, over this year and kind of seen in Dave like four things that I really love. Um, there's probably more, but I'll just stick with four. Um, number one is is he really loves the Lord. He really loves Jesus, and that's really clear. And number two is he really loves and respects God's Word. Uh, he's, he's a Bible man. He loves the, the Word of God. Uh, and number three, he loves God's people. He loves the church, and he's devoted and committed to the church. And fourthly, he loves people who are far from God and wants to see them come home. And I kind of like heart to heart. That's like tick, tick, tick tick and and that's how I think we've we've gelled quite well and and really appreciated each other's ministry and I really thank Dave for his friendship and his leadership of this community and, and what's been happening here over a number of years it's been great um, just a couple of things uh, Dave preached last week at Mount Barker and he had about a 10-15 minute introduction where he said that doesn't count for his preaching time <laughs> so this doesn't count for my preaching time just letting you know um, I, I said I grew up in Adelaide, I did, and um, kind of had a fairly chaotic upbringing in Adelaide. My parents split when I was about four or five. The only kind of memories I have of my family are, are lots of arguments, uh, physical fights, um, feeling terror as a child as my parents uh, fought and screamed, and then eventually dad left and um, lived with my mum, single mum, brought us up, me and my sister here in Adelaide. And then through my teens, kind of got into quite a, a troubled um, cycle in my teens. Uh, my mum was a, a lovely mum, but a bit of a hippie free spirit person. And there was uh, all sorts of people and parties around our house at times and, um, and drugs and all sorts of things. And, and I got into that. When I was 11 years old, I, I smoked my first joint. And um, from there, kind of through my teens, just started to get into you know, more and more smoking of dope 
um, drinking, kind of all that at-risk behaviour that you do when your life's a bit in turmoil and you're emotionally hurt and wounded and uh, you don't know God. And went through that time, kind of the ruins of, of the teenage years. I managed to keep a job as a chef, uh, apprentice chef. I did an apprenticeship. Um, I hope you didn't come to my restaurant when I was stoned, but um, I did my best. <laughs> I, I did my best, all right? Um, but I managed to keep a job. And, but eventually things kind of spiraled and started to get into hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic drugs and really, um, you know, mentally just started to spiral down got quite depressed, felt quite hopeless, was, was longing and, and looking for something real, something hopeful. And the kind of philosophy of the world that I'd picked up was you're born, you live, you die, and there's nothing. And I couldn't bear living with the thought of that's it. If, if life is just you live and you die and there's nothing, well, then why bother? It's painful, it's hurtful, it's difficult. And I, I kind of answered that question myself in a certain way as I got to being 19 or so and, and felt life wasn't really worth living anymore. Um, I, I had a serious car accident when I was about 19 down at Seaford coming home from McLaren Vale at a winery where I worked one night. A couple of young guys were getting away from their A um, couple of other young, young guys chasing them in a car. They turned their lights off. They, they went cut across the highway. I was doing 80 and I hit them head on. And their car rolled about three or four times. That guy was expected to die. Uh, he, he survived. Um, and I had multiple minor injuries, but kind of trauma and lots of lacerations and cuts. And I remember laying on the side of the road. I could hear sirens and lights and people were gathering around and I was laying in glass. I had my chef uniform on. There was blood everywhere. And I remember just laying there and these words came up into my heart I wish I had died and I was disappointed that I didn't die because life was so hard life was so painful life had no hope no meaning thankfully there was a young single mum who worked at the winery where I worked who in terms back in those days was a dish pig uh, she washed dishes. I don't know if you use that term over here. Uh, or, or these days, it's probably not PC or anything, but she was, that's what we call them. A dish, she washed dishes, a dishwasher, kitchen hand. And her name was Lynn. And um, she was a Christian. And I was into everything. I was into all sorts of spiritual stuff. I was into all sorts of occult things, whatever. I was kind of open to anything. And she asked me one day, Nick, do you believe in Jesus? So I ended up with her in this kitchen each, each week and she asked me, do you, do you believe in Jesus? I'm like, well, I don't really know anything about him. And so tell me <laughs> who's Jesus. And um, she began to share with me her faith and talk about who Jesus was. And it was at that point when I had the car accident that I began to hear about Jesus. I had a friend from high school who I used to do lots of bad stuff with. He became a Christian. I hadn't seen him for a few years. He looked me up uh, around the same time. So someone was praying somewhere for young at-risk people in Adelaide who were ruining their lives. So thank you. Um, because these two Christians showed up in my life simultaneously and my mate Greg began to share his faith with me, faith with me and I was quite arrogant. I mean, my, my knowledge of Christians was when I asked Greg if he wanted a cup of coffee, I said, oh, you wouldn't have a cup of coffee because Christians don't do drugs. So that was my... <laughs> knowledge of what Christians were. They, they didn't drink coffee. Now I know that most Christians are coffee addicts. And um, <laughs> one of the good things about coming to Adelaide, Amanda and I, we lived in a, in a fairly ritzy suburb in Melbourne, um, in, in a church community that was there that wasn't ritzy, but it was a very expensive suburb. And there's lots of great cafes and coffee. So coming over, we found a couple of good coffee shops in the hills. Emotionally, we just kind of melted. We're like, it's, okay, it's going to be okay. <laughs> we've, we've got good coffee. So, um, so Greg started to share with me and Lynn. And then I had this accident and I, I lay in bed recovering for a week or two at home, starting for the first time to really think, well, what would have happened? If I had died, who would I have been? Where would I have gone? And because I'd started to hear about God and I'd believed in God to a certain degree, I, I used to pray, I used to kind of think there must be a God, there must be someone responsible for all this creation. And it started to dawn on me, what if this God is real? What if, 
how could I stand before him? So it kind of fast-tracked my spiritual search. And not long after, I was invited to a concert down in Hindley Street. This heavy metal band from Paradise AOG was playing there, Christian group. They'd been praying and fasting for this gig and I was invited to go along. So I finished work on a Saturday night. I went down to Hindley Street to the Century Hotel and there's this Christian metal band playing and uh, I walk into the, to the Century Hotel and on the left is kind of my normal crowd at the bar, you know, kind of hanging off the bar and smoking and whatever. And I'm thinking, okay. And then over here is like all these kind of shiny Christian people. Um, and I kind of, standing at the door, it was like I felt two pathways before me and I was outside a bit later talking to this guy I don't know his name and he started to share his testimony with me what God had done in his life he had a story like mine broken family broken life drugs all sorts of problems God came into his life met him changed him saved him transformed him and he shared his story with me. And he looked me in the eyes. He must have seen the faith that I, that I had at that moment. And he said, Nick, when you go home tonight, mate, get down on your knees, pray and ask Jesus to come into your life, to be Lord of your life. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And he looks again. He goes, well, do you want to pray now? So I'm outside the Century Hotel, midnight on a Saturday night. Um, he calls over a couple of his other heavy metal buddies, long hair, leather everywhere, buckles and studs, all that. They put their arms around me and we gather in a circle and they just pray for me. And I just simply said something like, Jesus, come into my heart, be Lord of my life. And you know what? He did. <laughs> and from that moment, he, he came into my life. And I didn't know what it was at the time, but it was like I felt this hazy, smoky presence of love all around me. And it was like I felt someone turned on the dishwasher inside of me on the wash cycle and just started to wash me clean inside. For the first time, I felt clean. I felt free. And I met Christ. He, his spirit came into my life. And I remember driving home crying and singing and I didn't actually know any Christian songs then. I think I was singing a Sinead O'Connor song. Um, <laughs> Nothing compares to you. Yeah, it's kind of... It's kind of all I had, right? Um, but it was good enough and God knew my heart. And I just wanted, there was no mobile phones then, but I wanted to ring Greg. I wanted to ring Lynn and just say, I know what you've been saying. I know what you've been saying. It's true. It's real. I get it. I've tasted it. And, you know, I saw Greg again and, and he knows, but I never saw Lynn. And one day I've always thought coming back to Adelaide, I want to be preaching somewhere one day and a, a lady in her 60s will come up afterwards and say, I'm Lynn. <laughs> and I'll say, Lynn, thank you. Thank you so much for stepping out <clears throat> in your workplace 30 years ago to a, a broken young teenager whose life was on the precipice and for taking a risk for risking rejection, for risking scorn, for risking looking like an idiot or feeling like an idiot and opening up to me about your faith in Jesus. Thank you. Well, that's now my preaching time starts. All right, let's go. <clears throat> um, let, me, let me pray. I'll just pray as we transition, let me pray. Father, thank you for Nehemiah. Thank you for this amazing Man, this amazing story, this amazing time in Israel's history. Lord, use this word, use these scriptures to speak life, to speak truth, to speak hope. Uh, Father God, thank you that you are the God who, who loves to come into the ruins of our lives and rebuild and revive. Lord, revive the ruins in our lives, the, the ruins of our churches, the ruins of our world. Lord, continue to do your work, we pray, through your church, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now, I'm, I'm a bit of a kind of a, um, like, lots of things preacher, so I'm going to put lots of things out there. Some of these things might not be particularly pertinent to you, but they might be to someone sitting next to you. So if you're like, yeah, I know that. I get that. That's okay. This could be for someone else. But I want to do a quick flyover, a Bible flyover um, of the Bible because not everyone who's in church knows their Bible. Um, some people are searching or trying to work it out. And it's a big book. It's like 66 chapters. It's like 66 books, 39 authors written over 
1,500 years in three different languages. It's huge, right? So if we just jump into the Bible sometimes, it's like you've moved into like halfway through the third Lord of the Rings trilogy movie or book. And you're like, who the heck is Frodo? You know, or perhaps maybe that you're, you know, Gilmore Girls, Gilmore Girls, like episode eight. And you're like, you know, is, is, does Lorelai marry Luke or what's going on? Who, who's Luke? And you don't know where you are. So just a quick Bible fly, flyover so we know where we are. Um, we have creation, you know, Adam and Eve. God creates a perfect, beautiful world. It's fantastic. He creates uh, a space for Adam and Eve to rule and reign under Him. It's glorious. It's wonderful. It's, it's great. It's creation. God creates the heavens and the earth. And then the first humans believe a lie. Somehow this mysterious presence of evil is there in the creation, this satanic figure, and tells them a lie and they believe the lie. And they lose their place as God's kind of sovereigns over this earth. They lose their place and they're plunged into darkness, into a cursed creation. They're cut off from the garden. Humanity falls and we're part of that fall. We have fallen with them away from what God wanted. That's, that's the fall. But then God says, I'm not done with humanity. He begins a rescue plan and he calls one man, Abraham. Genesis 12, Genesis 15, makes a covenant and agreement with him and says, Abraham, I haven't got many friends on the earth. Would you be my friend? And I wanna do a special work through you, Abraham. I wanna rebuild you and your family. And through your family, I wanna create a new family, a new nation of people who will love me and serve me and who will display my glory to the world and through whom I can rescue and redeem lost and broken humanity. And Abraham's like, okay, sounds like a good deal. And Israel, that's the beginning of Israel, the Old Testament, okay? That's where we are. We're in the Old Testament. And Jesus, of course, the New Covenant Christians, that's who we are. Um, He's come. He's fulfilled all the promises. He's done the work. He's got the victory. uh, And He has risen. And we're moving towards a new heaven and a new earth that God is bringing all things together for good, making all things new. So that's a quick Bible flyover. And also just quickly what Jesus said about how to read the Old Testament. You know, Jesus did a Bible study when he raised, was raised to life as the resurrected Lord. One of the first things he did was a Bible study. And he said to the two disciples along the road to Emmaus, he said, you know what? He said, don't be silly. You should know what's going on. He said, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the Scriptures, that's all the Old Testament, concerning him. So Jesus said, when you read the Old Testament, you've got to look for him. You've got to look for allusions to him, um, how it foreshadows him, how it points to him, how it fulfills uh, what he has done, how it points to that. And then he said to the the others when he um, met them a little bit later on in that same chapter in Luke, He said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. That was kind of a Jewish way of saying the whole Bible. And so Jesus says, when you read the Old Testament, look for him, try and see him, find out how it points to him. And just one more quick flyover. This is an Old Testament flyover um, just for you history buffs. So Abraham's about 2000 BC or BCE, if you're more of an academic. Um, 1500 is Moses and the Exodus brings the people out of slavery, 1500 BC. 1000 BC, King David ascends to the throne because Israel's like, we want a king too. We want to be cool like the nations around us, you know. And God says, but I'm your king. And they say, yeah, but we we want like a real king with like a sword and a shield. And, you know, and God's like, oh, thanks a lot. Okay, have a king. So he gives them a king. King David is a great king, man after God. God's own heart, reigns for 40 years, builds up Jerusalem, doesn't build the temple because he has blood on his hands, he's a warrior. And so God says, your son, David, Solomon, he will build my house, my temple. Solomon, by the way, who was the offspring of David's adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, did I mention he also had her husband murdered? Another story, we won't go there. So King Solomon builds the temple, God's people are gathered, God's presence comes, Israel has this amazing, glorious season. Powerful nation expands, extends. It's amazing. It's huge. The people and the kings fall short. They begin to turn away from God. They begin to disobey God, forget His laws, go their own ways, blend with the cultures around them, worship false gods, 
treat one another with violence and indifference and hate. And God keeps warning them saying, guys, I don't want you to live like this. I don't want you to be like this. You need to obey me. You need to do what I'm calling you to do. And they're like, okay. And they do that for a while. Then they turn again. This goes on for decade after decade. Eventually, God says, if if this keeps happening, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be judgment. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. And about 250 years after Solomon, the Assyrians, Israel's enemy, capture the northern kingdom. Ten tribes taken away. We don't know where they went. Never seen again. The Assyrians destroy half the kingdom of Israel. The Judean kingdom, the northern kingdom, sorry, the southern kingdom, they keep getting the same message from God. Hey, guys, listen to my laws, follow me, obey me, do what's right, treat one another with love. And they're like, okay. And then they go back and they, this goes on and on. Then kings rise up. There's good kings who lead the, the nation well and lead them to God. There's other kings who lead the nations into pagan worship and idolatry. And it just keeps going on. God says, if this keeps happening... You saw what happened to the northern kingdom? It'll happen to you guys. If you keep rebelling against me, if you keep disdaining my laws and my ways, eventually it's going to be bad for you. And they're like, eh, whatever. 586, the Babylonians come in. They come in about 20 years before that and they sack the city or begin to sack it and take away all the nobles, all the intellectuals, all the artisans, all the really gifted people in the city. They take them away to Babylon to employ them for the, to serve the Babylonians. And then eventually there's some rebellions in Jerusalem and people kind of kick up and say, well, you know, let's fight the Babylonians. Let's fight back. Eventually the Babylonians go, we've had enough. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, sends in his armies, powerful armies, And he completely destroys Jerusalem. This is the city of God. This is the city where God lives. This is the city through which God is going to rebuild the world. This is the city through which the Messiah will come. And the Babylonians raise it to the ground. They don't just raise it to the ground. They pull all the stones down the wall. They burn the temple. They take away all of the gold and all of the treasures of the temple. They burn all the palaces, all the homes. They flatten the city and burn the stones. It's a wreck. It's a ruin. Israel is in shame and disgrace. And the Babylonians leave just a small population of very poor, destitute people in the city to look after the vineyards and the crops, to keep giving taxes to the Babylonians, but the whole city's destroyed and they go into exile. But in 538, the Persians take over from the Babylonians and King Cyrus is a bit more of a noble king than Nebuchadnezzar and he lets the Jews return to Israel, to Jerusalem, to rebuild the city, to rebuild the temple. But it doesn't go very well because they're poor. They're not very organised. They eventually get the temple done. It's not that great, not like it was. And they're in a mess. And about 100 years later, here we are with Nehemiah. And he's living in comfort in Babylon. He's maybe fifth generation Jewish person living in Babylon. So he's probably never been to Jerusalem. But he's living in comfort. He's the cupbearer to the king. He's like the chief of staff for King Artaxerxes, and he is in a privileged place. He would live in luxury, but he's still a faithful believer of God. He's still a faithful Jew. He knows the Scriptures. He prays, but he's there. He's comfortable. Things are going along okay. But he gets a report from his brother, either his Jewish brother or his real brother, we don't know, but he gets a report, and this is the report. I'll read from Nehemiah 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the, in the month of Kislev, which was about November, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Like, how's things going, guys? They said to me, Nehemiah, it's really bad. Those who survived the exile are back in the province and they are in great trouble and great disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down and the gates have been burned with fire. And Nehemiah, God does something in his heart when he hears about the ruins and the disgrace. 
And he says, when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. I wept. For some days I was mourning and fasting and I prayed before the God of heaven. So his comfort is disturbed when he lets God open his eyes and his heart to the ruins of his people, to the ruins of the city of God. He's crushed. He's in grief and despair. Reality comes crashing in on him and shakes him and wakes him from accepting captivity and longing for God's promises to be restored to his people. He can't eat. He can't sleep. He's a broken man. He's a broken man. What about as we look at the state of the church in the West? Do we sometimes feel a bit of that brokenness as well? Here's a few stats for you because... Stats are good. Mount Barker District Council 30 years ago was 66% of people identified as Christian. Today, it's 37%. It's almost halved or it will halve probably by about now. Look at the churches in the Adelaide Hills. Look at the decline over the last 10 years. The Anglicans by 26%. Uniting Church by 33%. Lutheran Church by 26%. Presbyterian by 34%. The Salvation Army has had a 64% decline in the last 10 years. The Church of Christ, 24%. Now, a lot of that is just people who were nominal Christians, who weren't really going to church or a part of a church, just writing on the census Oh, I think, you know, my grandparents were Salvation Army, I think. But yeah, what do we love? Oh, we're nothing. Okay, you know, so put that down in the census. So a lot of that's just kind of, you know, generally people balancing up. You don't have to say you're a Christian anymore. And there's some, you know, there's a, there's a few bit of good news in the stats as well. So the Catholics, God bless the Catholics. They've been stable, rock solid, no change over the last 10 years. <laughs> So yeah, shout out for our Catholic friends. Um, the Pentecostals, God bless the Pentecostals. They grew by 17% in the past 10 years. Um, non-denominational grew by 33%. That's probably where a lot of the other Christians went. They became non-denominational, I don't know. The Baptists, that's our tribe. We had a 28% growth over the last season. I think that's pretty much all you guys, so well done. Um, <laughs> good work, keep it up. Um, but in real numbers, if you kind of do the real numbers, that's about 570 people from those three denominations added over the last 10 years, which basically equates to this church. All of our Christian activity in the Adelaide Hills, we're reaching about one person a week. Now, that's Jackson, great, that's good. Let's celebrate that. We're reaching one person a week. But in some ways, you know, Dave said last week at Mount Barker, does this break our heart? And these are his words. Are we stirred up in our emotions to see the ruins restored? To see the church be what God created it to be? To see the kingdom of God advancing and taking ground? To see broken lives and lost lives finding hope in Jesus? And Nehemiah is crushed as he thinks about the state of his people, the state of Israel, the state of the, the people that are meant to bring salvation to the ends of the earth and he's, he's crushed by it. He doesn't stay crushed. He, he becomes convicted. He's like, something's got to change here. Something has to change in me. God has to do a work in my heart and in, in my people's heart and he becomes convicted. He mourns, he fasts, he prays. Um, this is on us, he says. We rejected God. We turned our hearts away from him. This is why we are in captivity, why Jerusalem is in ruins. He, he warns, God warned us for centuries, Nehemiah thinks. He sent his prophets. We were told this would happen if we continued to willfully turn away, blatantly disobey and selfishly go our own way. Nehemiah knows that it was not King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians who tore down the wall of Jerusalem. It was God and he warned them. And this is Jeremiah the prophet who writes his book of Lamentations, which is a, an outpouring of grief and sorrow at the state of Jerusalem falling and the people going into exile. This is what Jeremiah says. The Lord has rejected his altar and abandoned his sanctuary. He has given the walls of her palaces into the hands of the enemy. The Lord determined to tear down the wall around daughter Zion. Daughter Zion, such a beautiful, tender name for Jerusalem. He stretched out a measuring line and did not withhold his hand from destroying 
He made ramparts and walls lament. Together they wasted away. This is a great prayer and declaration about God's sovereignty. When bad stuff happens in our lives, when bad stuff happens in our world, it's not that God makes it happen, but God is over and above it. And He is sovereign. And the Jews knew this. They're like, yes, the Babylonians came in and did the work, but we disobeyed God. We turned away from God. We rebelled against God decade after decade after decade after decade. And eventually He had enough. He reached His threshold. And I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about how Jesus becomes for us the one who absorbs the wrath, the the anger of God against evil and injustice and the hope that the gospel gives us. So let's look at Nehemiah's prayer. He he confesses. Listen to his prayer. Um, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps His covenant of love. See, He remembers God's love even in the midst of the destruction with those who love Him and keep His commandments. Let your ear be attentive to, to your pr- and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night. For your servants, the people of Israel, my people, He says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. Keep in mind, Nehemiah, is 150 years after the exile. He wasn't in Jerusalem. They weren't his sins. He didn't do anything wrong there. As far as we know, he's a godly man in Babylon, you know, standing against the Babylonians in his faith privately and quietly. But he confesses, he aligns himself with his people. And I think sometimes we do that as Christians in the church. We're like, hey, yeah, I love Jesus, but you know, the church, I'm not so sure about the church, you know, and we can easily kind of separate that. But you can't love God and not love his people. You can't. Well, you can, but it's not biblical Christian faith. So Nehemiah says, look, I wasn't part of that gang of wretches who disobeyed God for 200 years, but they're my people. God's calling me to align with them and to be in in communion with them. And so he prays this. We have acted very wickedly towards you, Lord. We have not obeyed your commands or your decrees, your laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses. And this is what he, he reminds God of God's promises. He says, this is what you said, Lord. If you are unfaithful, this is God speaking, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if you are exiled at the farthest horizon, I will gather you. I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in serving your name. Give your servant success today by granting me favour in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. So Nehemiah knows he has to confront the king or go into the king and ask for help. And he reminds God of his covenant. Lord, I know we've done wrong. I know we failed, but you also said, whenever we turn back to you, whenever we turn around, you receive us. You'll run to meet us. And that's such a word of hope for anyone here today or anyone listening. If you think, I've failed, I've fallen short, I've messed up, I got it wrong. Okay, confess that. But the promise of God to you is infinitely greater than it was to Nehemiah. We have it written in the blood of the Saviour not just in the words of Moses. Come back. God will receive you. God will will embrace you. So Nehemiah reminds God of his covenant and he gets gets clarity. He gets clarity around what he has to do. And he spends four months. By the time he goes in to speak with the king, four months has passed. Four months of praying, of fasting, of crying out to God. He doesn't just act hastily. And sometimes we can do that, you know, we think, we'll pray. So we say a quick prayer and then we kind of move on. No, he spends four months in a season of prayer, fasting, preparing the way before he goes in to speak to the king. And it's brilliant when he does go in and speak to the king. This is chapter two, the few verses there. In the month of Nisan, four months later, 20th year of King Artaxerxes, 
Um, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been in his presence. I had not been sad in his presence before because if you were sad, the, the king wasn't happy. Um, you wouldn't just be fired. Uh, you could lose your life. Uh, he's a powerful king. And the king said to me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And I was very much afraid, says Nehemiah. He's in the court. This is a powerful king. And he said, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Now, what Nehemiah is doing there is so brilliant. The Babylonians, ancient people, had a very high esteem for the graves of their ancestors. They venerated them. They worshipped them. Have you seen the pyramids? They're tombs, right? So he's identifying with something in Babylonian culture that can open the door for what God wants to do. He's finding alignment with the king and the king's heart is moved. He's like, that's terrible. The the graves of your ancestors are in ruins. That's unacceptable. And it's a brilliant strategy and it comes out of four years of praying. I just, I just, four, four months of praying, sorry. So pray, 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 and then God will show you the way. But just a word on Babylon as a picture in the Bible. Babylon is a place, it is a city, it was an empire, um, but it's also a kind of a metaphor, an image for the system of the world, the, the spirit of the world that's over and against God's people, seeking to destroy them, seeking to thwart them, seeking to harm them. And it operates on several levels. It's like the geopolitical international where you know nations are moving against nation and we're like, what's going on? There's the, the, the people of God level or the church level. How, how is the, the, the Babylonian kind of empire impacting us as God's people? There's the personal level, like how much of Babylon is in my own heart? How much do I love the things of this world more than I love the things of God? It impacts our own heart. So I just want to quickly, um, actually, I'm going to jump over to courage on the slides, if you don't mind. Um, I'm just going to skip a section there. But I want to talk about just Babylon on a personal level uh, in our culture. It's becoming harder in our culture to be openly Christian. Christians are, are, are no longer really welcome in the public square. Like they were decades ago, it was kind of a bit of a Christianized culture. I don't think we've ever been a Christian country. Talk to me about that later. But um, in Babylon, you know, faith had to be private. You had to kind of hide it because it wasn't acceptable to the Babylonians for you to you know, proclaim your faith and your God in that culture. And we're seeing a bit of that in the West, this kind of squeezing in of pushing the church more and more to the margins. And I, I just saw recently uh, some of the rugby players from uh, Manly and they had to make a decision, these are devout Christian players, on whether they'd wear the pride jersey in the game. Now, I'm not going to go into any big issues around this, this matter, but just simply to say I loved what Hamali Alaku Atu um, I'm sure that's not how you say it, but he called his parents the night before the game and kind of said, what do I do? Um, And the parents said, follow your heart. And this is what he said. I don't know what else to say. I hope everyone just respects our decision and moves on. Listen to this. My faith comes first before anything. It is who I am. And this is what Nehemiah did in Babylon. He risked not only losing his job, he risked losing his life by confronting the king in his court, seeking leave of absence. He didn't just risk his job, he risked his life. But he got to a point where he had to say, my faith comes first before anything. It is who I am. And that's the personal level that we each have to Uh, come to at a church level as well. Not that we want to bully or bash people or or anything or or cause distress to others in any way, but we need to at some point say, I want my faith to define who I am. I was down in Handorf the other day. Amanda's got a great gallery there. And um, if you want to visit, (laughs) 10% off for Hills Baptist people. Um, And we went for a coffee because that's what we do. Um, Friday morning, her Friday's off. And there were like four young women in the coffee shop and I recognised a couple of them from Allgate. Um, It was Abby who works there. They were having a Bible study in the coffee shop, all sitting there with their Bibles open and they were reading the Scriptures and then I had a chat with them and they asked me a theological question. I didn't really know the answer, so I was a bit concerned. (laughs) But 
I saw them later on praying together and I thought, isn't that beautiful? Here we are in a public space, a public setting, people reading the Word, praying together. But I also thought, don't take that for granted because the Jews had that as well in Israel. Their worship, their prayer, their celebration of their faith, and it was all taken away by the Babylonians. Uh, they went into exile. I think there's a word there for a church. Um, not to fight in terms of you know, a military way, but to, to stand our ground and to keep letting our faith be public. Nehemiah knows this. It might be comfortable in Babylon, but there's no ultimate security or hope there. Babylon's gone. That kingdom went a long time ago. Hope is only with God's people, with God's purposes, His personal revival of faith, Nehemiah's personal revival of faith, leads him to align himself more fully with God's people and God's purposes. As God revives him, his heart becomes more open to his people, the people of God. For us, that's the church. And to God's purposes. For them, it was to rebuild the city so that the Messiah could one day come. For us, it's to go into all the nations and proclaim the good news of Jesus. And prayer was at the heart of it. Opening our hearts to the ruins around us will do that. The ruins in our lives, the church, the society. You know, I thank God that that Lynn opened her heart to me um, in my ruins as a teenager, 19-year-old, a ruins of a life. And she, she reached out to me. I remember meeting her once in the car park down the street in McLaren Vale. And I was talking to her and she said, you know, Nick, I'm part of a small group. I didn't know what that was because I wasn't a Christian. It's kind of Christianese speak. I thought they were just like really little people, but Lynn was quite tall. (laughs) So I didn't quite know how she fitted in. But I said, okay. And she said, Nick, I want you to know we meet every Wednesday and we're praying for you every week. I was 19 years old. Do you know what happened? I burst into tears. I thought, who are these people? My friends were ripping me off and stealing my my drums out of my car and my, my band gear. Who are these people? They don't even know me and they'd pray for me. Opening our hearts to the ruins of other people's lives will lead us to personal revival and prayer will do that too. And I love what R.A. Torrey says in his book, How to Pray. It was a master stroke of the devil to get the church and the ministry to lay aside the mighty weapon of prayer. He does not mind at all if the church expands her organisations and her deftly contrived machinery for the conquest of the world for Christ. If she will only give up praying, He laughs softly as he looks at the church of today and says under his breath, you can have your Sunday schools, your social organisations, your grand choirs, and even your revival efforts, as long as you do not bring the power of Almighty God into them by earnest, persistent and believing prayer. And you'll see all through this book in Nehemiah, at every point, Nehemiah prays. He prays. He gets the people to pray. They hit a barrier, they pray. He's a man of prayer. And I felt really bad about that considering we've cancelled the prayer meeting today. <laughs> but, but God is gracious and God loves us and you can still pray. You don't have to be there um, in person. And as we, we move, as we, we kind of wrap this up, I just want to reflect on Nehemiah as a, as a type of Jesus, a prefiguring of Jesus. Nehemiah, he gets to Jerusalem. He goes through the gates. He inspects the ruins around the city. But around 450 years after Nehemiah, someone else would walk through the gates of the city, most likely the sheep gate on the other side of the city and walk out bearing a Roman cross to a place called Golgotha. This time not to rebuild the city, but to redeem the world. When Nehemiah started, what Nehemiah started, Jesus finished. Nehemiah wanted to rebuild the city and the temple so the presence of God would return. But Jerusalem was broken down again. That temple went in 70 AD. But Jesus came to bring the presence of God to us within. All of Nehemiah's work and the work of his fellow Israelites came crashing down in 70 AD. The work that Jesus has done is eternal, unshakable and unbreakable. Nehemiah paid a price to rebuild the ruins, but Jesus paid it all. And here's what Isaiah said about him in Isaiah 53. It was the Lord's will to crush him. Think of that. It was the Lord's will that Jesus would be crushed 
Jesus went willingly to the cross, but it was the Lord's will and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, for our sin. Remember Nehemiah almost had to rebuild the temple so that the people could make offerings for their sin. The temple was the place where people would find forgiveness, where they would find God's mercy at the temple. But the temple's gone, but it hasn't gone. Jesus is the new temple. He's the temple. He's the dwelling place of God's presence for us. And He brings us into His presence, His life. He will see His offspring and prolong His days and the will of the Lord will prosper in His hand. He will see His offspring. That's the people who will believe in Jesus, who will become His sons and daughters by faith, His brothers and sisters. God has done this. Nehemiah built, rebuilt the ruins temporarily, but Jesus is rebuilding the ruins ruins of our lives for eternity. He's taking not the ruined stones of Jerusalem and building a wall. He's taking our ruined lives like living stones and building them into His holy temple. We'll be priests of God declaring His praise for all eternity. Jesus rebuilds lives. Jesus restores ruins. Jesus raises the dead places in our hearts and our lives. And I invite you as I pray, whether you're a believer who knows the Lord and who loves Him, whether you're someone who's feeling a bit distant from God or away from God, whether you're someone who's searching and not sure about who He is or what He's done, I invite you to lean into this prayer and open your heart. And then we're gonna sing together in worship. Father, thank You so much. Thank You for Your will unfolding in Nehemiah's time that he heard your cry for your people to be rebuilt, for the nation of Israel, the temple, the walls to be rebuilt so that worship could happen there, so that your word could go forth again in that nation. But thank you that Nehemiah was rebuilding for us. They were rebuilding the walls and establishing Jerusalem again, ultimately for us who would believe in the one who would come. Like Nehemiah who left his palace in Babylon, his luxury and went to the ruins of Jerusalem, our King Jesus, the actual King who left the glory of heaven, who left the glory of the kingdom of heaven and came to the ruins of this earth, the ruins of our lives to bring hope to bring life, to bring restoration, to bring renewal, to rebuild the ruins. Thank You. Thank You, God, that in Jesus, our lives can be rebuilt. Our churches can be rebuilt and made stronger. Our world can be remade, the new heavens and the new earth that You are bringing. Thank You for the vision of the Apostle John. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Lord, make us a bride beautifully dressed for You. As a man, I'm not ashamed to say that. Lord, make us Your bride beautifully dressed for You, King Jesus. Lord, we are Your church, Your people. Bless us, strengthen us, encourage us, build us up, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters here, particularly people who are feeling the ruins right now, who perhaps through no fault of their own, perhaps through every fault of their own, it doesn't matter. Lord, thank You that You are the God who forgives, who restores, who looks at ruins and sees a new masterpiece, sees a new building. Thank You that You are the God that takes ruins and builds them into something beautiful. Beauty for ashes. Beauty for ashes. Thank You, Lord. Rebuild us. Bless us. Lord God, strengthen us and help us put our arm to the work like Nehemiah to pray with all of our heart, but then work with all of our strength to bring Your good news, to bring Your hope to our communities, Lord, to bring Your life in the power of Your Spirit. We love You, Lord. You paid it all. Jesus, You paid it all. You gave it all. 
You deserve everything, all of our lives, Lord. Let us hold nothing back, we pray. And if you want to pray with someone, I believe there are prayer team here or elders who'll be around the room as we sing and worship. If you want to pray with someone, you don't need to tell them a lot. Just go up and say, I need the Lord's blessing. I need you to pray for me. Uh, Go and do that. And um, yeah, the Lord bless you.